Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Welcome in online. We're going to go straight into our family prayer this morning for time's sake. I know the Lord has laid a message on Greg's heart and he's uh, ready to preach it. So we don't want to forget our family prayer though. So let's all just take time to pray for our families, our family church and the family of God all around the world. Everybody pray right now. Lord, we're just so grateful today. We want to come with thankful and grateful hearts to you, Lord. God, I thank you for my family. Thank you for Greg, for being the spiritual leader of our household, Lord. And God, I pray for my children and grandchildren today. Keep them safe and healthy, Lord. My mom and my brother and sister, Lord. Thank you, God, for my in-laws. And I pray that you would be with them and keep them safe, Lord. God, I just pray for our church family today. Keep us all healthy, Lord, and, and ministering for you, God, and your children all over this world. We are so grateful, God, that one day we'll spend it in eternity with you. Just be with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, worship team. Praise the Lord. Wonderful presence of the Lord here today. Seemed like as we begin to praise Him and thank Him, He just kind of just, just kind of hovers in with us today. Thankful for His goodness. Each and every week, each and every time that I preach, I uh, try to find the mind of God. Well, it's going to be a good service already. We're going to start with a Kleenex. <laughs> but I'm humbled today. If I've ever heard God speak to my heart, it's this message. <clears throat> and... I guess the reason I'm crying is because I feel such a heavy anointing and I want to minister today from the Word of God. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 24. We'll begin there. Pray a special blessing upon Teresa today. I gave her so many scriptures and Thank God for you, hon. Exodus chapter 24, beginning in verse 9, 9 through 18. When you found this in your Bibles, please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Exodus chapter 24, beginning in verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, also they saw God, and did eat and drink. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. 
And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Thank you. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of this morning's message is The Noise of War. The noise of war. In John, the 14th chapter, Jesus was about to ascend to be with the Father. And he told the apostles, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. As Christ addressed the church, his desire was to give them a promise of hope for his return. In our day-to-day activities, we must not lose sight of this promise. Folks, Jesus is coming again. I know it's been over 2,000 years since he left, but folks, Jesus is coming back. I know we've heard it all before. We've heard it sing about. We've heard it preached about. We've heard it taught all of our lives. But folks, Jesus is coming back. I know the world seems to be getting worse and worse, but Jesus is coming back. I know that it seems that evil goes without punishment, but Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. In Luke, the 24th chapter, turn there with me. Jesus has given us some indicators of his return that we may begin to understand in what time frame that we're living in. Mark uh, chapter 24, I'm sorry, chapter 21. I'm Luke chapter 21. (laughs) I got you flipping all over the place. Just look at what... Teresa puts up on the screen. Hopefully I gave it to her right. Luke chapter 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. According to these scriptures, everything from the sun to the moon to the stars, on the earth the stress of nations, perplexity, seethe and waves roaring, men's hearts falling for fear, for looking after the things which are coming. But it says when these things begin to take place, then look up and lift up your heads, for redemption is drawing nigh. Folks, Jesus is coming. The King is coming. Turn with me to Psalm chapter uh, 24. Uh, Who is this King of glory? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? It's the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in what? 
in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. It says he's the Lord of battle. He's the Lord of glory. We need to uh, uh, not only have an image of Jesus the Lamb, the babe placed in a manger in Bethlehem of Judea, but folks, when he comes back, he's not coming back as that Lamb which uttered not a word, which opened not his mouth. The Bible teaches us he's coming as the King of glory, the Lord mighty in battle with a sword drawn, with a vesture dipped in blood. Jesus is coming. I'd like for you to turn to two or three people and tell them Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. The King of Kings is coming. The Lord strong and mighty in battle is coming. The Lord of hosts is coming. Jesus is coming. In this age of carefree, conviction-free, conscience-free religion, many have seemed to have forgotten that our meetings together are supposed to be designed to prepare us for his return. You see, Jesus is coming after a bride who has prepared herself with him in mind. Our teaching, our singing, our preaching, our praise, our worship must be about him. When it ceases to be about him, it becomes reduced to being about ourselves. How does it make us look? How does it make us feel? I feel in urgency to declare this morning to this generation that there is a spiritual war taking place right now the magnitude of which is unprecedented upon the face of this earth. A war of such spiritual deception that even the very elect would surely fall if God should not shorten the days. In this message, God's desire is to awaken our spirits and open our understanding to the noise of war that is raging. The portion of scripture that we started with this morning in Exodus chapter 24, this is after God had delivered the children of Israel from Egypt with a high hand. The lamb was slain, the blood was applied to the doorpost of their heart, the doorpost of their residence, and God led them out of, of Egypt with a high hand. He miraculously parted the waters of the Red Sea. They walked across on dry ground. The chariots of Egypt tried to follow, and the sea uh, closed back upon them, drowning them. They saw Pharaoh as a threat to them no more. They were led then uh, from a pillar of fire by day and a cloud by night uh, that they would reach uh, Mount Sinai. And there, on that way, God provided uh, manna from heaven. He provided water uh, from the rock. And there at the foot of Sinai, God met with them there. And we just read the, when uh, uh, God called uh, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and certain 70 of the elders of Israel up into this Mount Sinai to meet with them there. He had spoke to them the word. The all camp of Israel, thousands upon thousands, had heard his voice and accepted his covenant. They had an oral agreement, if you will. Yes. Thank you, Lord. That he would be their God and that they would be his people. And this all covenant was sealed by the sprinkling of blood. But then God invited a representation of the people up into the mount to see him. He 
he's described as we read of having feet and hands and standing upon a sapphire stone his countenance as a devouring fire this representation even ate and drank in his presence I, I, I feel I, I need to take an aside here for a few moments and let you know that God has always will always right now has a desire to fellowship with humanity in the Garden of Eden, we know that Adam and Eve walked with God in the coolness of the day. God's desire was to fellowship with them. Uh, and in the New Testament, Testament, Jesus met in fellowship with the apostles in the upper room. Even he cared after the uh, resurrection that there were two men on the way to Emmaus and, and, and they were uh, had some questions and they were sad and Jesus pulled alongside of them and they didn't recognize his visage but he cared about what they were going through what they were was causing them to be drugged down and said I want you to take hope today I don't know if someone here or someone listening online needs to hear this but Jesus cares about what you're going through He'll pull alongside of you. Maybe he's pulling along right now. Maybe you can feel his anointing just letting you know, I know what you're going through. Sister Elsie, Jesus knows what you're going through. Sister Gayla, Jesus knows what you're going through. And I can call each and every name out, but I know this, not only does he know, he cares. His desire is to fellowship with us, to wrap his arms of love around about us, whatever we need. Sometimes we just need to feel him hug us. Brother Frank, he cares what you're going through. And sometimes he wants to just put his arm around you, draw you up into his big lap of love, Brother Bill, and just hold you and comfort you and let you know somehow, some way, hold on a little longer. Everything's gonna be all right. He cares. And he desires to fellowship with us. This representation ate and drank in the presence of God. Then he called Moses up a little higher. <laughs> and the rest of the representation went back down to the people. Joshua was Moses' minister, so he followed Moses a little bit more. But then there was a higher plane that Moses had to go on alone. Wherever you're at in your walk with the Lord will probably find you in one of these groups. Maybe you right now in that group that's, that's at the bottom and you're looking up and you're seeing the thundering and the lightning and, 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 go, and, and you're, you're, your mind is like, what in the world is happening on top of that mountain? And maybe you're a group that of those seventy in Nadab and and by you that that had got called up and and you're in fellowship with the Lord. Oh, it's good to be in that group, isn't it? 
Oh, Lord, your fellowship is so, oh, so blessed. Oh, God, you're just, you've taken me places that I thought was impossible to go. Or maybe you're in that place of ministry that you can go a little higher. I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there. You see how the group, <laughs> the numbers begin to get less and less the higher you go. It's a price to be paid. But you can go higher. Go a little higher. The challenge is go a little higher. Go a little higher. It may get steep. It may get rocky. It may go into the unknown where no one has seen. The cloud is hovering over and you don't know where you're going. But go a little higher. Step a little higher. Get on your hands and knees if you have to and crawl. But keep going higher and higher. There's a higher plane than I have found. Yeah. You remember that song? Lord, lead me on to higher ground. So Moses went on up a little higher. And God was delivering to him the plans for the tabernacle. And as we read, he left Aaron and her in charge. If anyone had anything that they needed to take care of, approach Aaron and her while he was gone. Now, chapter 32 of Exodus. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. We read in chapter, uh, uh, what was it, 20, 24, how long Moses was gone? 40 days, 40 nights. Somewhere toward the end of that 40 days, they forgot all about Moses. <laughs> we don't know what's become of him. And Aaron said to them, well, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings which are in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron, and received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool. And after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. When they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Moses delayed to come down from the mount. Moses here was a type of Christ. In John 14, uh, we read that for a particular reason. Uh, Moses was sent to deliver Israel. Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea. Moses uh, provided bread from heaven, water from the rock. And here he represents how that Christ uh, uh, was going to be with God the Father, but with a promise to return. Now, if Moses was a representative type of Christ, then we must realize that the children of Israel were a representative type of the church, purchased by the blood of the Lamb, called out from the world, chosen by God to be his people. They were given a, a verbal oral covenant and were waiting for the consummation of this covenant when their faith would become sight. We read that Moses was gone for 40 
days. Somewhere toward the end of this 37th, 38th, 39th day, one or two or three days before Moses was to come back, the people didn't know how long he was going to be gone. The people didn't know, Joe, it was going to be 40 days. We don't know the day or the hour. It wasn't necessary, Jennifer, that they know how long. The thing that was necessary is they knew he was going to come back. Yeah. It's not so important for us to know when. What the important thing for us to cling to and to hold on to and, and, and to rest assured in is the fact that Jesus is coming back. He said he was going to, therefore we know that he will. Yeah. Sometime, one, two, or three, just a short time before Moses was going to come back, they got tired of waiting for his return, for his direction, and they gathered themselves together, and they approached Aaron, who was left in authority, and demanded for him, take us the rest of the way to Canaan. Now, there's something missing here. Do you see it, Brother Lynn? Aaron wasn't the only one left in charge. Moses said, Aaron and her are with you. And if you have any matters to deal with, they will deal with it. Her is introduced to us earlier in the Bible as, as when uh, uh, the children of Israel were at war with Amalek and Moses went up to a mountain, Joshua was out fighting and Moses held his hands up and as long as his hands were held up, you know this Bible story? That the battle went well for the children of Israel but as Moses got tired and his hands began to fall, the, the battle went against them. So the Bible tells us that Aaron and her, one on one side, one on the other, held Moses' hands up and supported them so that the battle could be won. So who is this guy? We know a lot about Aaron, but we don't know so much about her. Her was the son of Miriam, the sister of Moses. He was of the tribe of Judah. Aaron was the priestly tribe. <laughs> Judah was the ruling tribe. And is. That's where the kings come from. And so up there in that, in that battle, on that rock, we see that symbolically Moses' hands were held up by the law <laughs> and the prophets. <laughs> so... When Moses went on up a little higher, he says, what I'm going to do is you're going to be in subjection while I'm gone to the law and the prophets. To her and Aaron. Her was the grandfather of Bezalel who established the city of Bethlehem. Why didn't they approach her? Well, they did. And they, books and volumes and volumes of Jewish oral history known as the Mishnah, the Jewish historians declare that the people first approached her with their plans. And he rejected them and upbraided them for their rebellion and they killed him on the spot. Now afterwards, when they approached Aaron, Aaron knowing what had become of her and being weak under this pressure, submitted to their wishes. 
We want not what has become of Moses. Up make us gods, which will take us the rest of the way. Psalm 37 verse 23 declares, It's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Now Aaron, realizing that any time you depart from God's direction, God's glory, you must rely on your own, told the people, bring of your substance to him. They no longer, if they were departing from the provision of God, they were going to have to make their own provision and make their own way. And so they gave him of their substance and, and, uh, and, and they approached him and, and he melted it all together. All of these different rings, all of these different metals melted it together. All the people's substance. Listen to this preacher preach today. <laughs> They were turning away from what God was offering and God's direction. And then they began to gather together all that they had as a substitute. And Aaron melted it all together, fashioned the people's substance into a substitute for God. Aaron made a molten calf. Why a molten calf? Why this golden calf? Because it was the image of the cheap idolat the chief idolatrous Egyptian god Apis, whose principal seat of worship was in Goshen, which is where the Israelites dwelt in Egypt. They had been in this Egyptian world that wasn't their world for so long that it became so easy for them to embrace the lifestyle of Egypt as theirs. They had forgotten that they were a called people, a set apart people, a people chosen by God, a people that was to walk by faith and not by sight. And when doubts arose and they got tired of waiting, they went back to what was so familiar to their flesh. And they made the molten golden calf. Now remember lot. Remember, as we read in chapter 24, there were leaders of Israel in 9 through 18. They saw God. They fellowship with God, Steve. They ate and drank in His presence. They described hands and feet and, 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 and all that, that we described earlier. They knew he didn't look anything like a molten calf. They knew in their heart of hearts that this thing that they were now worshiping had no resemblance to the God that they saw. And in verse 5 of chapter 32, Aaron declared a feast, a Sabbath, if you will, claiming that it was the power of this idol which had delivered them. Remember the words spoken to them by God in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 5. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Less than 40 days after God had covenanted with them, they broke every commandment directed to their worship of the Almighty. Now, while this was going on below, God was communing with Moses. In verses 7 and 8 of chapter 32, 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which has brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So, he told Moses what was going on and sent him back down. On his way down, verse 15, let's pick up there. And Moses turned and went down from the mount and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua, where was Joshua? He had gone up higher. He didn't know. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on above him. He didn't know what was going on below him. But he was waiting. He had a lot of questions, but he was waiting. He didn't have a lot of answers, but he was waiting. You identify with Joshua? Sometimes we need to know that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It's hard for us to wait. It's hard for us to be patient. It's hard for us to not know some things. But sometimes we just need to be patient and wait. So Joshua was waiting. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, That's no, not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but it's the noise of them that sing do I hear. Now Joshua was appointed unto Moses to be his minister. And he'd accompanied Moses higher into the mountain. While Moses went further, and Joshua had stayed awaiting Moses' return, if, jo if Moses was a representation of Christ, if the Israelites were a representation of the church, then surely Joshua in this instance becomes a representation of the Holy Spirit who in these last days resides within the hearts of those who are true believers. Moses knew exactly what was going on in the camp, referring to the outward show and workings of the flesh that the people had eaten to satisfy the hunger of the flesh that they had drunk and they drank to deaden the conscience of the mind and then when drunk they rose up to play which in the Hebrew definition in its fullest sense refers to a word called hedonism which is gratification of the flesh usually resulting in sensual perversion. The earmark of hedonism is the phrase, if it feels good, do it. Joshua spoke through the mind of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost and declared, there's a war going on. Joshua, representative of the Spirit-filled last day's ministry, who saw the blending of godliness and worldliness, who saw Satan attacking God's people through the spirit of compromise, declared there is a war going on. Amen. 
It's been over 2,000 years since Christ uttered those words that we read in John 14. Moses was gone 40 days. This rebellion took place on the very eve of Moses' return. Church, we are on the very urge, the very brink of Jesus' return. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4 speaks about this generation that says, where is the promise of his coming? We've heard it all of our lives, but when's it going to happen? We don't know what's become of this Jesus. Where is the promise of his coming? We're tired of waiting. We don't know what's become of him. The children of Israel realize though that, that they got to do something. And so they began to fashion something amongst themselves using their own capabilities and resources. And they made something because they had to continue to be religious. And the thing that they made had no resemblance to what God was. Let's read some scriptures earmarking this time in which we're living uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. You know these scriptures. Well, somebody took Timothy out of my Bible. There it is. <laughs> now the Spirit speaketh especially that in the what? In the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, <coughs> speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the what? Last days. Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away uh, the fourth chapter, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Everyone say sound doctrine. They won't endure it, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Just as the children of Israel demanded of Aaron what they wanted, there is a movement gaining momentum that people are demanding the ministry. You cater to our desires or else. You say it the way we want it to be said. You say it the way we want to hear it. You interpret the way we want it interpreted that will not condemn us. Amen. Consider the calf. Men who knew what God is. Fashioned something from the bounty of the people and proclaimed the result to be God. When they knew that it wasn't. Today, many who surely have had an encounter with God are combining talents and substance into a form of godliness, but without the power which is our relationship with Almighty God through the person of Jesus Christ. Is this all right this morning? There is a gathering together that is not of God. Do not be deceived. Just because everyone is getting involved in it doesn't mean that it's of God. 
this movement is not confined to a particular denomination or style of worship. I wish it was. It would be easy to identify and go the other way. It's not identified by a name on a sign or a particular style of worship. Uh, it's deeper than that. It's in the flesh. In, it's spiritual in nature and must be discerned spiritually. Of all the gifts of the Spirit that we need desperately working in the body of Christ today, it's the Spirit of discernment. Matter of fact, I challenge you all, everyone here, everyone listening, pray for the Spirit of discernment. Let me tell you, let me tell you how this movement is earmarked though. It's earmarked by rebellion against the word of God and a desire to govern themselves to bolster personal goals. How about enough negative? <laughs> Let me tell you about another movement. There's another gathering together, another gathering taking place. You see, in order for there to be a war, Joshua perceiving through the Spirit that there is a noise of war going on, in order for there to be a war, there's got to be more than one side. And I've identified the earmarks of this other side that's taking their talents and, and their resources and their numbers and, and, and their compromise and gathering it all together and lumping it together and, and putting together something that has no resemblance of the body of Christ and calling it the body of Christ. We've identified that. We've identified the earmarks of rebellion and desire to govern themselves and, and even turn away from the word of truth if need be. But I want to identify another one. The other side of this battle. There's a gathering taking place. Joel uh, chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Oh, don't you know? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. Yea, it's nigh at hand. God has always had a people. And God has a people right now. And all of believers who are shaking themselves off from this dust of wilderness, who are walking by faith in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, who are living in the fear of the coming of the Lord, who are embracing these precious truths, who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We who are declaring, let every man be a liar. But this is true. This is true. I am in this army. You're in this army. And we declare we have a God. We have a deliverer. We have a leader. We have a soon coming king and his name is Jesus Christ. And through him, we shall be victorious. Would you stand with me this morning? First Thessalonians chapter 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, to the best of my heart, I desire to give birth to this that you planted within me. In these few moments this morning, I feel like you poured your heart into us. Lord, the flesh questions so many things. Why this message? Why this preacher? Why this congregation? I don't know. I feel like Gideon when you called him and he said, why me? We're least. I just believe, though, Lord, that you haven't just called me and you haven't just called this congregation. But I believe in every congregation and behind every pulpit, thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of faithful ministers and faithful members have answered the call, come a little higher. Have answered the call, shake yourselves. Shake yourselves. As Moses got to the foot of that mountain, to the people, your word teaches us that he asked the question, who is on the Lord's side? I feel your spirit asking that question. Who is on the Lord's side? Who believes the word of God? Who fashions themselves to the blessed book and not desires to fashion the book to themselves? Who changes when the book says change and not tries to find a loophole or an excuse to live contrary? Who knows who you are and desires to be like you. We feel your spirit, Lord, drawing us. Be the body of Christ. Walk in light, not in darkness. Walk soberly, not deadened and lull and drunken. Jesus, I commit. We as a congregation commit. We, as the hundreds of thousands of the body of Christ, commit the Lord, Him we will serve. We will have no other gods but You. We'll walk in Your statutes and in Your ordinances. We'll live life by the Spirit, being obedient to Your Word. You hear our prayer of affirmation today. We ask that you'd go with us. Continue to lead us on. In Jesus' name, we submit ourselves to you today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May God bless you. Hear the sound of war and make sure we're on the right side. God bless you.